Well, good evening, everyone. My name is John Kroll, and thank you for coming to this wonderful event here in the heart of the Berkshires. In spite of the rain, it still is gorgeous, and a lot of people did uh, come in from out of town, so uh, thank you so much. Your participation is incredibly important to this wonderful event, and we have the voice of Paul Mark even coming in already. Uh, <laughs> incredibly important as the efforts on paint and mattress recycling is one piece of an overall vision to create a more sustainable and environmentally friendly Berkshires and Massachusetts and beyond. Tonight we have a wonderful panel of guests who have traveled many miles each to be here, which we certainly do appreciate, and that will help us understand how the cooperative product stewardship laws are pulled together and what we can do to make these laws a reality. But first, tonight we do have uh, our state senator, Paul Mark, who was in North County today, as you can imagine, he was surveying a lot of the damage uh, from the heavy, heavy rains over the last several days uh, in his district uh, here in the Berkshires. Uh, but he will be here with a recorded message. So, uh, Tom, if you want to pull up uh, a message from Paul Mark. Hello there, this is Paul Mark, I'm based in Pittsfield and 56 other cities and towns in Berkshire, Franklin, Hampshire, and counties. And I am really sorry to not be with you at the table tonight. Uh, unfortunately, we've had some flooding incidents this year. You probably tell us what's happening out in uh, the Connecticut River Valley part of my district. And so we've been touring a couple of areas that were hard hit today with uh, Governor Haley himself coming with Queensburg and the Downs. And now with Commissioner of Agriculture spending some time out here in Wakey and Conway with us. And a thing that kept coming into my mind today that I think is really relevant to the event you're having tonight is climate change. And climate change means that there's going to be more extreme weather. There's been a lot of extreme weather over the last couple of years. I remember Hurricane Irene not too long ago that really devastated a lot of Western Massachusetts. And now this flood, you're talking about damages in the millions of dollars. You're talking about lost production of crops. You're talking about lost seasons for family farmers and for small business. And waste disposal is going to be a major part of how we mitigate climate change. When I do things with workers, with local community groups, one of the hardest things I find to get rid of, and so therefore, one of the things I find the most put aside uh, rivers, put aside streams, all on the side of the road in, in these hidden areas is paint. And so making it easier for producers to take back products that are toxic, that are hazardous, that are going to lead to climate issues, and making it more easy and more available for people to find an easy way to return and recycle these products, I think is crucial and critical to mitigating climate change, to making our environment better, to protecting our beautiful region that we love so much, and for trying to make sure that in the future agriculture is sustainable, making sure that there's not poisonous chemicals flowing through our water, making our crops in, in, in jeopardy, damaging our ecosystem, damaging our region. We have a lot to offer in Western Massachusetts. We have a lot to offer in the Berkshires. And a big piece of that is keeping a beautiful climate, keeping a beautiful environment, making sure that we are sustainable and renewable as we move into the future. So I am honored to be here to quickly introduce a couple of remarks and introduce a great panel that I know is going to speak and talk a bit about the legislation that was before the Senate, that was before the House. I'm happy to be a co-sponsor of And I want to thank Tom for his advocacy for putting all of this together making sure that we are included and thank Casey for my staff who I know is there tonight and hopefully is going to get this video and get it posted correctly and I appreciate the opportunity to speak quickly and again really sorry not for doing it but um, when there's an emergency we go over and we want to make some real something which will be for all of it. So have a great session tonight and hopefully I will work with you in this. And thank you very much to our state senator, Paul Mark, and uh, keep up the good work. And I just want to quickly introduce our panelists, and then we'll give a more in-depth uh, introduction uh, to each of them. Uh, to my left uh, is Juanita Traber. She is the chair of the Massachusetts Product Stewardship Council and vice president of Mass Recycle. Let's hear it for Juanita. <laughs> <laughs> And we have Justine Fallon, who is the Director of Operations at Mattress Recycling Council. Thank you, Justine, for coming. 
And in the center of our panel is Heidi McAuliffe, who is the Vice President of Government Affairs for American Coatings Association, ACA. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. So tonight, each of our panelists will have a presentation, uh, and then we will uh, have questions uh, in our forum, and then also take questions from you, uh, audience members, uh, tonight. So we'll start with Juanita. Juanita is the chair of the Massachusetts Product Stewardship Council, the vice president of Mass Recycle, and in her day job, the director of sustainable materials management for the city of Newton. In addition to advocating for the advancement of extended producer responsibility laws in Massachusetts for the past seven years, she has previous experience working on electronics, EPR, and packaging waste policies for both the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and the Product Stewardship Institute. Juanita graduated with a Master's of Science in Waste Management from the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point in 2012, and has been a passionate uh, individual about working in the materials management space since, including taking a professional adventure to manage hazardous waste at McMurdo Station in Antarctica. We were just talking about that before. Quite an experience there during a 2014 and 15 Austral summer season. How about that? So here's Juanita. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here in the Berkshires. Um, I don't know that I've been to Pittsfield before, but it is a lovely town. And um, I, I happen to avoid the rain, so I don't know how I pulled that off. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk about kind of the lay of the land right now in Massachusetts. Um, the focus of this talk is advancing a specific policy mechanism called extended producer responsibility, and I'm going to go into that momentarily. So I sit on the board of directors for an entity called Mass Recycle. It's the only 501c3 nonprofit in the state that is dedicated to sustainable materials management policies. Um, we focus on educating, uh, connecting, and uh, educating and connecting uh, people in the field of waste management in the state and advocating for smart policies. Uh, we are very focused on <laughs> pragmatic policies that work for all the stakeholders in the system. Uh, we are a membership organization. Uh, a lot of municipalities are engaged. A lot of vendors in the space, like waste haulers um, or recyclers, are engaged with our organization. And the Massachusetts Product Stewardship Council is a formal subcommittee written into the bylaws of this 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, so our mission in the, this formal subcommittee, pro, uh, the Product Stewardship Council, is to shift the costs of materials management away from taxpayers and municipalities onto the producers that generate those materials in the first place. Um, so those of you that are tuned into the waste management space, uh, we municipalities are tasked with managing all of these materials at the end of life. But that is really not something that we excel at. It's, it's a very challenging system, and especially in Massachusetts, the way that it's broken down municipality by, by municipality, it's very inefficient. And so costs are going up, um, and we're running out of space. So there's a capacity crisis in the state of Massachusetts, um, not unlike surrounding states, Connecticut being the one that comes to my mind immediately. We do not have enough space for the trash that we generate. Currently, about 40% of the trash that's generated in this state is exported to other states, and that is increasing year after year. Um, and there's no new capacity that's expected because no one wants a new landfill or a waste energy facility, certainly not in their backyard um, or in their town. Uh, so I don't see that changing. And so the impact is that municipal costs are skyrocketing. Um, I've so I work for Newton in my day job, and uh, I've been analyzing and paying attention to when our contracts end and kind of the landscape of what the costs are um, for towns that have passed recent contracts for either their hauling service or their waste disposal service. And we're seeing cost increases in the range of 20 to 40 percent. Um, and so that's very significant for municipal budgets, and it's kind of hard to plan ahead for. 
Uh, the solution is to divert more waste, to reduce our waste that we're generating in the first place, and uh, we need to just cut down on the amount of waste requiring disposal. Uh, we also need sustainable funding for this system. And again, tax dollars, I really don't think are the answer. It's kind of an inefficient use of, of tax dollars. Right now, in, unless you live in a system, in a town that has a system for pay as you throw, um, and you're paying 100% of the costs using that program, then tax dollars are basically subsidizing that, that system. And you know your neighbor could be putting out six cans of trash, and you only put out one, but you're paying the same amount. So it's really an unfair system and not thought of as a utility, but that's where I want to bring folks to, to be thinking about it similar to water or electricity. We should be paying for what we generate or what we, the space that we're using in the system. So one of the policy mechanisms that has been identified in other jurisdictions, states, countries, um, is product stewardship and extended producer responsibility. So product stewardship is the umbrella term. And then there's different, um, I would say, brands underneath that. So there's manufacturer responsibility or other government regulatory programs. Um, and then under manufacturer responsibility or producer responsibility, there's voluntary efforts or there's mandatory programs, which uh, extended producer responsibility is that mandatory form um, of this law. So it basically gets baked into a law and is a requirement as opposed to uh, a company uh, generating products or maybe selling the products, doing something on their own. So product stewardship is the act of minimizing impact, negative impacts of a product or its packaging throughout the life cycle. So that could be any number of things, and I have a couple of examples in a, in a moment. The manufacturer or producer of the product has the greatest ability to minimize those adverse impacts, whereas we on the municipal side, we have zero say in the design of products or um, what gets put on store shelves. We, we don't have any kind of influence on that at all. Other stakeholders, such as suppliers, retailers, and consumers also need to play a role. Certainly that is expected. We all have responsibility within the system. Um, but again, pointing to the original equipment manufacturer is they have the most control kind of at the uh, start of the supply chain. And stewardship can be either voluntary or required by law. So that's that kind of umbrella term. Then extended producer responsibility is specifically this mandatory law that would be passed. Um, it includes, at a minimum, the requirement that the manufacturer's responsibility for its product extends to post-consumer management of that product and its packaging. Um, so, for example, we're going to talk about paint. So, a paint and the paint can. So, paint is the product. The paint can is the package that it comes in. Uh, and so that's what that's referencing. Um, this, these laws shift the financial management and responsibility um, using government oversight upstream to the manufacturer and away from the public sector. It creates incentives for the manufacturers to incorporate environmental considerations into the design of their products and that packaging. Um, the way that these systems are set up is that there's a fee that's somehow baked into the point of sale cost. So it's either internalized where you don't know how much you're paying into the system as the consumer of a product, um, or it could be an external fee where you see it at the point of sale. Um, our other speakers will touch on that. And um, that money goes into a fund that pays for the collection of the material. And the manufacturers are responsible for managing that fund and for setting up the collection network system. So the benefits are to reduce or eliminate the cost burden for municipalities, uh, to relieve, possibly relieve, but I would say certainly put some relief onto the collection and labor burden from municipalities collecting these. So think of your transfer station or even um, some curb, sometimes curbside collection, the amount of work that is put into getting something from point A to point B to point C. 
Uh, it typically increases the convenience for the consumer or resident, and it may incentivize <laughs> producers to develop longer lasting products if they're paying for the system or kind of um, managing the system, they want it to be as efficient as possible. Uh, it may incentivize producers to reduce waste or incorporate recycled content or increase recyclability. That really depends on how the law is crafted. So um, there are ways to, to incentivize those things baked into the, the way the law is written. Um, and it generates specific metrics to track the system. For those of you that are tuned into the waste industry, there's very little data. And every town is tracking things kind of apples to oranges. And so it's difficult to see where you're improving. And so creating these systems helps track all of that and, and make things much more apples to apples. So this is just kind of a graphic um, from the Product Stewardship Institute. Um, and that's where those definitions also originated. It's, an, it's a nonprofit organization that works nationally and internationally. It's based in Boston. Um, but they are tuned into kind of any state that's working to pass one of these laws. Um, and so this just demonstrates that the system incorporates product design um, from the producer side, um, educates the consumers, and has the um, recycle or reuse or safe disposal kind of baked into the entire system. So those th three things work together. Um, it's kind of a designed system as opposed to what we have right now, which is what it has morphed into over you know decades, but was never designed by anybody intentionally at the outset. So some example programs. So product stewardship programs that are voluntary. Um, there's a Dell program where they take back electronics at like Goodwill stores, and so they pay for the recycling, the responsible recycling of electronics that are brought there. No one's requiring them to do that. They do that of their own volition. Um, there is a program called RAP that is by the American Chemistry Council. Um, so they take plastic bags, like film, um, film plastic, so like the really thin, you know, the shopping bags. Um, and they will accept those at grocery stores, and then those get put into um, composite decking, like Trex is the brand. And so no one's asking them to do that. They're doing that because they want to. Um, and Staples is another good example. They take back ink cartridges and things like that. So they're being stewards of the products that they work with or that they manage um, or create, but no one's forcing them to do it. And then extended producer responsibility is a requirement by law. And some examples are paint care, which you'll hear about, bye-bye mattress, which you'll hear about, <laughs> and the Vermont e-cycles program, which is their electronics uh, recycling program. So across the United States, there are 133 of these laws that cover 17 different products um, across 33 states. And so 265 million people in this country live in a state that has an EPR system of some fashion. Um, in Massachusetts, we have two laws on the books that would be qualified or classified under this umbrella term of uh, extended producer responsibility. They both relate to mercury products, which is great. We want those to be easy to get rid of. Um, but I think we could be doing better. So <laughs> Maine has really taken off with extended producer responsibility. Vermont has just passed another extended, response, uh, extended producer responsibility law um, tying them with Maine. Uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut and New York are all tied. And we are kind of being left in the dust. Um, I believe New Hampshire has one of the same uh, mercury laws that we do. Uh, so taking a look at this legislative session, um, there are several bills that we are paying attention to for paint, mattresses, and packaging and printed paper. Our focus is on paint and mattresses. And I, I will get to that in a second as to, as to why. Um, but these are the bills that are introduced this session that we are paying attention to um, and putting our emphasis on. So something to pay attention to is why these laws would or would not get passed. Um, I would say, uh, you know, overall, conceptually, it's a good idea. But then, you know, there's in any law, you're going to have someone who agrees with it and someone who's going to be negatively impacted. 
So stakeholder dynamics are kind of the thing that I chose to focus on. Um, so we have a ton of support in Massachusetts to, pa to pass um, paint stewardship. And that includes the American Coatings Association, <laughs> um, municipalities, environmental organizations, um, the local paint retailers, and residents um, that we have spoken with at household hazardous waste events or um, just folks that call and don't know what to do with with paint. Um, we believe that there's opposition from some of the big box home improvement stores, um, but I would say it's not loud opposition. Um, for mattress stewardship, it's a little dicier. There's two separate bills, they're competing with one another, and different stakeholders sit on different sides of, uh, sit on, in support of different bills. So I think it's going to be a little bit more challenging to get everyone to agree on, on one bill. So what we're looking at is a strategy to advance EPR. Um, I am focused on paint this session because it has minimal opposition. It has strong united support. Um, it's a proven model working in other states. But the problem is that it's a small bill. Uh, we've done some survey work and gathered information from municipalities and estimate the cost savings to municipalities would be about $2 million annually across the entire state. Um, so that's not a drop in the bucket, but in line items of municipal budgets, it is not, you know, at the top. Um, mattresses are a much bigger cost, and so this data, the $10 million annual municipal savings, um, is actually from before the ban was passed in November. So now some of that um, municipal savings is actually going to be passed on to an individual consumer um, where they would be paying a lower fee than say 50 to $60 that some places are, uh, some municipalities are charging for mattress recycling now. And then what I like to refer to as the big fish is packaging and printed paper. So packaging and printed paper is the material stream that consists of our household recycling. So packaging is again, thinking of like a yogurt container. The yogurt was the product, the yogurt container is the packaging. So when I say packaging, that's what I'm referring to. It's like plastic bottles, metal cans, um, all the things that we would put into our household recycling, in addition to printed paper, which would include things like cardboard, um, cereal boxes, office paper or a newspaper. Um, so that is very challenging to um, move forward on, which is why it's not one of our priorities this year. It has competing bills. It has strong opposition, um, divided support, and it is a model that is not yet functioning in the United States. Um, there are some uh, Canadian provinces that have this law and it's been successful and uh, several countries in the European Union that have this system and it's working. If this were to be passed, it would save municipalities $250 million or more because those costs continue to go up. So that's why we are focused on trying to pass paint. Um, looks like my, my uh, language got cut off a little bit, but it's very hard at the bottom uh, or kind of toward the the lower part of the that's sorry the materials towards the bottom are just very hard to pass and paint is less hard to pass it's not easy by any stretch um, but it's less hard so what we are asking from you all is to take some action um, the paint bill has been introduced i think for 10 years um, so that's at least five, maybe even six different sessions. And again, I think it's because it's a small bill that it, it's kind of struggling to rise to the top. Um, we are asking for you all to take some action um, to get authorization or work with your municipality that you live in or maybe one that you work for. Uh, to sign our endorsement form, which means that you would support passing these laws. Um, we have on the endorsement form for all three of those laws to um, demonstrate your support. 
And when there was a hearing a couple of weeks ago, we sent in our testimony that included the support from anyone who had signed that endorsement form. So as we continue to talk with legislators, we would um, add whoever continues to sign that. Um, you can also pass a resolution or work to pass a resolution in your community. Uh, this gets the attention of legislators because it's not an easy thing to do. And it's basically a statement from the local government saying this is something that would benefit us and we want to see our state uh, legislators act on it. Um, and then engage with our organization, the Product Stewardship Council. Um, so we are available to host or uh, do presentations um, similar to this. So for other organizations, we'd be happy to um, attend or do it virtually. Um, we hold monthly, sorry, bi-monthly meetings uh, that members of Master Cycle are able to attend. Um, and it's just discussions on kind of advancing this strategy. Maybe someone comes and has a question, oh, I spoke with my, um, my select board member and they have questions on this. Could you come and present? Something like that. Um, learning from other stakeholders that may have passed a resolution or have gotten that support to um, sign our endorsement form. Uh, and just spreading the word about what we're trying to accomplish. That is all I have. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Thank you, Juanita. And uh, for some housekeeping, a little bit of an emergent uh, situation. There is a blue Honda Civic license plate 25Y569 that is blocking the driveway. So um, if uh, that is someone's vehicle, if we can move that vehicle, a blue Honda Civic 25Y569. Uh, thank you, Juanita. And uh, now on to Justine Fallon. Justine is Director of Operations at Mattress Recycling Council, that's the MRC, where she oversees industry research and the implementation and improvement of the nationwide mattress recycling program called the Sleep Products oh, Sustainability sorry. Program, that's SP2 for short, which aims to reduce the environmental and social impacts of mattress disposal. She has 14 years of experience working as an analyst for the Mass DEP and over eight years with the MRC, four years as the director. She received her BS in environmental science from the University of Connecticut, so she is a Husky. So here is Justine. Thank you, John. I have to say it's, um, it's really great to be in Massachusetts. Um, as he mentioned, I, I worked with MassDEP. I managed the Springfield Materials Recycling Facility. So I'm very familiar with the, um, the communities in Western Mass, especially um, out in the Berkshires. Um, and I actually see some of my former colleagues, which is really exciting to see. And I hope that they're my future colleagues soon. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, oh, I keep going back. I'll get it. OK, so first I want to start um, by telling you a little bit about our organization. Uh, the Mattress Recycling Council is a nonprofit uh, that was created by the International Sleep Products Association that is the trade association for the mattress industry. Um, MRC started in 2013 to administer mattress recycling programs in states with supporting legislation. And um, the, the separation is that ISPA will work with new states during the legislative process, and then when the laws are passed, MRC steps in to develop a plan and to implement and administer the programs. Um, Bye Bye Mattress is our consumer-facing brand that is meant to be a fun brand experience to engage uh, with residents and businesses, and I'll talk more about that as we, as we go on in the presentation. Um, so we currently operate in three states, in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and California. Um, all three of those states passed legislation in 2013. Connecticut was our first state to launch in 2015, and you can see the other states um, followed soon after. Our newest state um, is Oregon, so that legislation passed in 2022, and we've been working uh, with all of our stakeholders in that state to develop our plan, and we anticipate to launch a program in mid-2024. So when ISPA is working on new state legislation, there are three key elements that um, they focus on. And the first is to administer um, programs that provide for the collection of mattresses, um, the you know, convenient collection of mattresses, 
funding these programs with a visible fee collected at the point of sale um, and educating the industry, consumers, uh, residents and businesses on mattress recycling, reuse, and proper disposal. So once a program launches in a state, like I said, that MRC um, will come in, we'll work with communities to collect mattresses through the existing waste streams. We think that's really important. People know where to go with their materials, um, so we try to work within, within the, uh, the local programs. So uh, we work with curbside programs. This is all in our current states. Um, we provide containers at transfer stations or landfills for no cost drop off by residents and businesses. We contract with recyclers in the state so that um, businesses and individuals can do dr direct drop off right at the facility. And we service retailers that take back mattresses when somebody purchases a new one. So we'll work with them to collect those mattresses and recycle. And essentially, we, we really work with any business that has a mattress that they need to get rid of. Prisons, the military, colleges, um, healthcare facilities. Um, so any of those, um, those types of businesses we will work with. Um, so just to talk a little bit about what's happening in our program states, I'll start with Connecticut. Um, we have recycled 1.5 million mattresses since we started in 2015. 97% um, of the state has access to um, no-cost drop-off uh, through our over 140 collection points across the state. This is what we like to see as a state you know, blanketed with collection sites. We have two recyclers in the state um, <coughs> that service our program, um, and we also um, you know, provide collection events um, across the state when necessary. Our next state is Rhode Island. Um, we have collected 600,000 mattresses in the state. Um, we have 38 sites. So every um, municipality has a collection container somewhere except for one town, um, and we're still, we're still working on that. Uh, these programs are voluntary, the participation. So um, <coughs> these entities that I'm talking about, they don't have to participate if they don't want to. So you know, we try to... Um, to let them know what all the benefits are and the avoided um, um, disposal costs <coughs> and some of the cost savings that uh, Juanita was talking about. So um, we have two recyclers that service that state. And then we have California, which is our largest program. Um, we've collected 10 million mattresses in the state since we, um, we started the program in 2016. Mm -hmm. We have 230 collection locations that are easily accessible to over 95% of California residents. Um, and we have nine recycling facilities that are spread across that state. <coughs> so once the mattresses are collected from um, all the different sources, um, MRC will transport them to contracted mattress recycling facilities where they're deconstructed. There are probably about 50 mattress recycling facilities across the country. Uh, we have a directory on our um, buybymattress.com. We have a site locator and a recycling facility directory um, that lists all of the mattress recycling um, facilities across the country, as well as the ones that um, are directly in our program states. Um, most of these are nonprofit organizations um, that have, uh, you know, a mission to. Um, provide second chance employment, um, to provide job skills, um, and they're you know, really mission-driven organizations. We, um, we contract with 10 recyclers, and some of the recyclers that we're working with in our program states are also nonprofit organizations, and um, we've had really great experience working with them, and um, we're proud that you know, they're in our collection network. Okay. Once mattresses are deconstructed, everybody likes to know, like, what happens <coughs> with all this stuff? Um, so the mattresses um, are mostly made of foam and metal, and we have really strong recycling markets, secondary markets for those. The, um, the market for foam is primarily carpet padding. Um, there are some recyclers that also um, sell foam for animal bedding. And then metal, it just goes, you know, for scrap metal. And in terms of the box springs, we have um, the wood will go to mulch. Uh, we have a recycler in Los Angeles that has, is working with a company that reconstructs shipping pallets. Um, so there's some diversity in, in those wood markets. Um, 
So our impact, we have in all of our state programs, we've recycled um, over 12 million mattresses at this point and diverted 450 million pounds of mattress materials from um, disposal in our state programs. So recently we announced the results of a life cycle analysis that we did in our <coughs> California program. We had some concerns because of the transportation of mattresses. They are big, they're bulky, they're really lightweight, um, and we travel really long distances with those mattresses. So we wanted to see if we, you know, what kind of impact um, that we might be making. So we hired a consultant, Scope 3 um, Consulting, to take a look at um, our program. It took them about two years to gather all the data and, um, and, and present the findings to us, but we were really pleased with the results in that we are a carbon negative program. Um, and um, you can see that some of the, um, the statistics are if you recycle, when we recycle one mattress, we save 500 gallons of water and the equivalent of um, the greenhouse gas savings of 60 vehicle miles traveled. So we really feel like we're making a good impact um, by, um, by recycling mattresses, even though they do make up a small part of the waste stream. So the LCA was part of our research program. We invest a million dollars every year in our research program. It's um, really important to us as an organization and as an industry to make sure that um, that this is that mattress recycling is sustainable for the long term. We invest in um, we work with our recyclers on lean manufacturing practices, fire safety, um, automation. We also um, provide um, money to our collection sites to try to increase the quantity and quality of materials that are coming into our recycling facilities. Um, and you know we we're actively um, working on about 20 research projects right now. You can find those on our website at mattressrecyclingcouncil.org if you're interested in, um, in taking a look at what we're doing. So um, since 2019, uh, we have been focused on working with mattress manufacturers on sustainability and circularity. Uh, we feel like at MRC we're in a really unique position to be the bridge between our mattress recyclers and the manufacturers to facilitate those discussions on designing products um, that are more recyclable and more importantly making mattresses and components more circular. Um, so we participate and helped launch um, an industry conference, um, sustainability conference every year. Uh, we have circularity work groups where we where we work directly with um, with manufacturers as well as component manufacturers to really take a look at how they are um, you know what they're what they're making and making sure that it's um, that it's it's circular or it's easier it's it's better designed for recycling. Um, we also launched in California a program called the Sleep Product Sustainability Program. And that is a facility certification for mattress manufacturers um, to really help them um, focus on air, waste, and water at their facilities and making sure that they're sustainable and using best management practices. So we have a really um, robust education and outreach program. Um, you know, we've been doing this for 10 years, so we've, you know, we're really focused on um, educating the industry, like I even I, I mentioned about the sustainability, um, but also retailers and consumers at um, the point of sale. We, we provide retailers with information so people understand why they're being charged a fee, uh, where they can go with their mattresses, why mattress recycling is important, and the impact that it makes. Um, we also um, provide uh, residents information on where they can go individually through Bye Bye Mattress. And all of our advertising and, and um, print materials really um, highlights that buybymattress.com site locator. We really drive people to that, to that site. It's very simple. It helps them understand where they can go, um, how mattresses get recycled, and, and why, we're, um, why we're doing that. Okay, so um, on the legislative front, ISPA is monitoring and engaging uh, with legislators in Minnesota, Maryland, New York, Maine, and um, Massachusetts. 
um, on bills that were per put forth during the, the latest legislative cycles. Uh, we haven't had anything passed yet, but we're hopeful. Um, we're also in contact with Washington, D.C., who have been interested in starting a program in that city. So um, most of you are aware, and we need to talk a little bit about um, the um, ban on disposal or transfer for disposal of mattresses. I can say just as the director of operations at MRC, we have a lot of concerns with these regulations, um, mainly because um, it's created this economic barrier to proper disposal or, and proper recycling. Um, Juanita mentioned like 50 to $60 for a unit. We've heard instances of $100 a unit. So these economic barriers can, you know, we're fearful they can create leakage <coughs> into our, these bordering state programs that are no cost um, and really disrupt um, the, um, the operations of those programs and the fin financing mechanisms that we have in place there. So um, because of those concerns, um, MRC has, or sorry, ISPA has worked closely rep with Representative Phillips in Massachusetts on House Bill 881. And what this legislation does is it, um, it retains the core successful model of our, of our current laws in, in our three program states um, and you know, Oregon um, that's coming up soon. But it's really enhanced um, by the experiences and the lessons that we've learned um, implementing and administering these programs over the past 10 years. And not only what we've seen operationally, but you know, really what our stakeholders have said, you know, it would be good if you could do this, or sometimes we've voluntarily done, um, done programs that then, um, you know, that we then included um, in this legislation because it just works for uh, within a state. Just um, some considerations. Um, the um, 881 has, you know, antitrust provisions, which is really important to um, to the industry, um, as well as um, enforcement. There is, um, as Juanita mentioned, there is um, other legislation, Senate Bill 513. Um, there are there are similarities in both of the the legislation, but the the biggest concern is um, in in 513, there are, um, there's additional fees um, embedded in that legislation for, uh, for wraparound services for one nonprofit mattress recycler in the state. And it's not for mattress recycling, that's not what the, the fee is for, it's for all of their social service programs. Um, and it really, um, you know, it creates an entirely different um, EPR model um, that um, you know can set a precedent that you know we want to keep it to mattress recycling because that's what we do, um, and you know it just can harm the um, efficiency of the program. So we're fully in support of 881 um, and working with Representative Phillips to um, to get that passed in the state. So um, that concludes my presentation. I guess I can pass it off to you. Mm -hmm. All right, let's hear for Justine. <laughs> Fantastic. And now we have Heidi McAuliffe. Uh, Heidi McAuliffe is the Vice President of Government Affairs for American Coding Association. That's ACA. She is the primary advocate for the coatings industry on trade, infrastructure, and chemicals management issues, as well as the ACA's product stewardship program, Paint Care in the Capitol and the nation's state houses. Heidi also previously served ACA as senior counsel, specializing in consumer products, dangerous goods transportation, and environmental issues, serving as the official representative to the United Nations for transport issues for the coatings industry. She has currently assumed co-responsibility for coordinating the World Coatings Council, and she is the executive director of the Graffiti Resource Council, as well as Paint Pack. A native of Cincinnati, Ohio, Heidi attended St. Mary's College in South Bend, Indiana, and earned her law degree at the University of Cincinnati. So Heidi, let's hear it for Heidi. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation. I, I see it's not raining now, so I'm hopeful that we'll get through the rest of the evening without uh, some rain. Um, I am thrilled to be here. 
Um, I've been working, um, well, I've worked at American Coatings Association for 30 years. Uh, I know the industry very well. Really started my career there working with aerosol coatings manufacturers <coughs> and, and learned that's a small segment of the paint industry. But what I learned in working with that portion of the industry is that they're, they are an industry who looks for solutions. They're really trying to find compliance strategies. They want to bring you products that work, um, products that are not harmful, products that don't harm the environment. Um, they're a very, um, very mindful industry. And I think our paint care program is um, just more evidence of that. It's been a, a pleasure of mine to work with this program. So this is one of my favorite issues to talk about. So um, what I like to do in my presentation is really kind of walk you through what the program looks like, talk about how we got to this point where we are today with paint care. Um, talk about the role of the paint industry in the program, then the role of municipalities, the role of retailers, and the role of the uh, state governmental organization, um, and give you really some of the highlights of the program. So let me get started. That's a brand new logo that we um, launched about a year and a half ago, so it's very colorful. We are the paint industry, so we like color. <laughs> um, so how did we get here? Um, you know, as I said, I've worked for the industry for a long time. Um, years and years ago, we used to um, receive information about communities on the West Coast that wanted to tax paint in order to pay for the end of life management um, or require retailers to take it back or require manufacturers to take it back. Um, I guess I'm a little embarrassed to say that we, we used to push back against all those types of efforts because in our manufacturer's point of view, paint is not a waste product. Um, it's, it's not formulated or manufactured to be a waste product. You should use all of that product up. So. Our initial response to those types of um, initiatives were, you know, that's, that's inappropriate. That's not really our problem. This is not a waste product. Um, but gradually, you know, through education, we, we realized what the issue was with leftover paint. Consumers, you know, stockpiling paint, paint contractors stockpiling paint the impact on municipalities and, and how do you deal with the end of life of this product. Um, so we did accept the invitation from the Product Stewardship Institute to begin talking about um, this issue and how do we find a solution. Uh, so we sat down with the Product Stewardship Institute with environmental organizations, with um, state environmental agencies, and with paint recyclers and members of the paint industry. And really started to talk about what were the main issues, what could be potential solutions. Um, this conversation lasted a long time, um, but at the end of it, um, what we had basically were the elements of the paint care program. Uh, a solution, what, what we thought would work from the industry perspective, what the environmental groups that we worked with thought would be a good solution, what state environmental agencies also agreed would be a good solution. And um, we made a commitment, the paint industry made a commitment at the end of that discussion that we would do a pilot project, actually see if this solution was going to work. And our goal really was to pass legislation in Minnesota, do a two-year pilot program there and see if we could actually set up collection locations, get paint in the door, transport it to recyclers, and recycle paint, diverting all of this waste stream from uh, a landfill. And we actually did pass the legislation through the legislature in Minnesota, but it was vetoed by the governor twice there. 
So we pivoted <coughs> to Oregon, and um, we did pass the legislation in Oregon for a two-year pilot program and uh, began working in Oregon, realized that, oh my gosh, we actually really can do this. We can collect this waste stream, div you know, divert it from landfills, recycle as much as we can, and, you know, and then make decisions about what was left um, in a very cost efficient and uh, um, considerate way. So that was the sort of beginning um, of this whole process. That was in 2008, and fast forward to today, um, this is the landscape of the pain care program. This is the, you know, we have programs now in 11 states plus <coughs> the District of Columbia. Um, Oregon was the first one. Once we completed the pilot program there, we did convince the legislature to make it a permanent program, so that became our first state. And then our goal really was to, you know, expand this program, you know, kind of march across uh, the United States. Um, like I said, that was 2008. We're in 2023. We still have a lot of ground left to cover. Um, um, well, I'll, I'll get into some of the legislative process issues. Um, before I move on from this slide, though, I do want to let you know that we have passed legislation in Illinois, so we're very hopeful that, the uh, that Illinois will be our next state. Um, I think the governor in Illinois has maybe 10 days left still to sign that legislation, maybe less. Um, so in a very short period of time, I think we'll find out about Illinois. And once, um, once we begin operations in Illinois, the states that we have covered here will pretty much take up 33% of the United States by population. California being our biggest program state, New York next, Illinois is the third largest state in terms of population. So um, we're very hopeful that we're going to begin working in Illinois very soon. So let me talk to you about what the program looks like and what's actually required under the legislation. So, um, you know, as I said, we, we had this conversation with environmental groups, state environmental agencies, recyclers, and the pain industry, and, and the three sort of foundational concepts that emerged from that conversation was, number one, we needed statewide, we needed to develop a mechanism for statewide programs. Um, we needed to have consistency across the states, and as much as possible, um, well, we needed consistency within the state, I should have said, and then as much as possible from state to state. So not a different program in every state. That, that would just increase our costs, lead to confusion, um, lots of negative impacts from that. And we wanted a level playing field for all of the actors within our chain. So from manufacturers to consumers to municipalities to recyclers. We wanted to develop some kind of a program that had a level playing field. Um, we needed sustainable financing uh, for this program in order to make it work. And we also wanted to have some control over that so that we could keep that cost as efficient as possible. And lastly, um, the antitrust protection um, uh, that Justine mentioned as well is critical uh, for the maintenance of this program. So those were sort of the three foundational elements um, uh, of, the, of the legislation. You know, from that, we kind of developed our model. What does our legislation actually look like? Um, so now let me talk specifically about how everybody works within this program. It's important to understand that the pain care program is required by law. I mean, we pass a law. The industry actively goes into the state. We hire a lobbyist. 
Uh, we try as hard as we can to educate um, members of the legislature, answer as many questions as possible uh, on the program. And at the end of the day, if we're successful, our manufacturers are required to do certain things under this law. And what are they required to do? So first, they're either required to develop some kind of end of life management system for paint or they have to join a stewardship organization and delegate those responsibilities to the stewardship organization. Um, the stewardship organization, or if a manufacturer decides to do that on their own, they have to then provide for the recycling and proper disposal of leftover paint. Um, there's lots of language in our model bill that talks about the EPA hierarchy, so we are fully on board with implementing that hierarchy, so reducing the generation, recycling as much as possible, um, then looking at disposal um, strategies. Um, there is a requirement to develop a business plan or a program plan and present that plan to the state environmental agency for approval. And within that business plan, we will discuss um, and articulate what it means to develop a convenient collection system, a convenient network of collection systems. You know, how many sites do we have to have? Where do they need to be located? We put all of that within our business plan. Um, we also talk about the uh, management strategies that we will employ once we have this waste stream in hand. How are we going to handle it? All of that is articulated in our plan. Once the, um, once the program is launched, once we're, already, we're collecting uh, product, we are required to provide the state an annual report, which provides lots of metrics, uh, including the to total volume of paint collected, method of disposition for every single can that we collect, must include an independent financial audit, um, as well as um, a description of all the education and outreach that we do. On top of that, the paint manufacturers or the stewardship organization is required to pay the agency for its time in overseeing this program. So all the time that the agency spends reviewing our plan, approving the plan, doing whatever enforcement they believe is necessary, um, reviewing our annual reports, um, all of that is paid for by the stewardship organization or the paint industry. So those are the requirements that are on the paint industry. If they don't fulfill those responsibilities, really the, the penalty is that they're not allowed to sell paint. Uh, you have to be operating within the system um, of paint care or have your own management system in order to sell paint in a state that has passed a paint stewardship law. So it, it's a... Um, I'll tell you that we've never had a manufacturer tell us that they did not want to participate, that they did not want to be within the stewardship organization and do this on their own. Um, and we've never had a paint manufacturer um, not register with paint care. So that's never really been an issue within our industry. It's, this program is 100% supported by the manufacturers. So what's the role of the state agency? I think I, I probably already ran through all of that, but, um, but I do <laughs> like this graphic. So. <laughs> um, so their job, the state agency's job, is not to run this program. The state agency's job is really to ensure that the paint industry is running the program. So the way they do that is to read our business plan, compare it to the law that was passed, and make sure you know, that we're checking every box, that we're doing education and outreach, that we're developing the collection of, uh, or the network of 
collection locations, that we have enough of them and that they're spread throughout the state so that there's access for everybody. Um, their job is to review the annual reports for the same reasons, to make sure that we're still checking all of those boxes. And, um, you know, and if there's any enforcement action or activity that needs to be undertaken, that's the role of the agency. Uh, again, it's not their job to run this program. Their job is to oversee that we're doing our job in running it. So the network of drop-off locations is, um, is expansive um, and really important to the program. So when paint care begins operations in a state, one of the first things they're going to do is reach out to all of you folks. The, all of you folks that are working at the municipal level, at the MRFs, with your HHW activities, we're going to reach out to you and say, we want to work with you. We know that you're the existing infrastructure. You're the experts in the field out there. So we want to work with you. It's a wonderful partnership. I hope that you'll all agree to do so when we pass this law. But that doesn't expand the access for folks in Massachusetts. The way we expand access and make this more convenient for folks in Massachusetts is to sort of reach beyond the existing infrastructure and ask retail stores that are familiar with paint, um, sell paint, so construction material stores, paint stores, hardware stores, um, reuse stores, um, all those types of outlets, we ask them to be collection locations for us. We provide all of uh, the materials necessary for them to do so. We try to make it a zero cost proposition for them. It is completely voluntary. They do not have to be a collection location. If they sell paint, they are required under the law to assess the fee that funds this program, but they do not have to be a collection location. Um, so it, it is a very important relationship for us. Um, we work very hard to educate the retail community. Um, we have a very good success rate in working with them. We, we lose very few retailers, um, and sometimes it, it's, it's a, um, you know, it's a logistical issue. They just really don't have the space to be able to put a cubic yard box in the paint department um, or something like that. But there are very good benefits uh, for the retail um, community. Um, we do try our best to sort of advertise where the collection locations are, so we raise their profile within the community. Um, they like being a good citizen, sort of offering this sort of value added service to their customers. <laughs> um, we increase foot traffic um, in their stores. So it, it, it is a very good relationship and, and paint care really can't be successful without that additional network. Um, the funding mechanism is next on my list. So, as I said at the very beginning of, of my comments, the funding mechanism is kind of a foundational aspect, concept uh, for this program, and we believe it's really one of the reasons why it is so successful right now. Um, there is a fee that is added to the sale of new paint that funds this program. So um, the fee is adjustable for the size of the can. It's a smaller fee for a small can, larger fee for a bigger can. Every time a, paint, a can of paint is sold, that fee is collected by the retailer. But the way this pro, this, the cash flow really starts is when we begin operations in a state and every single year after that, manufacturers will estimate what their sales are in the state whatever the fee is in that state, for instance, and, and I'll just, we'll just talk about the fee on a one gallon can. Whatever the fee is in that state, manufacturers will multiply their sales by that fee and they will send a check to paint care for that amount of money. That is 100% of paint care's revenue 
in that particular state. And when that manufacturer sells that paint through the distribution chain, that fee, that exact same fee, is added when it goes through the chain. Uh, so the retailer will pay that fee to the manufacturer. But when the retailer sells the paint, they will recover that fee from the consumer. Um, we, as the paint industry, have a vested interest in keeping that fee as low as possible. Uh, so we work really hard to make sure that whatever the fee is in your state, it is exactly tailored to the cost of services. And, and as I said, our goal is to keep that fee as low as possible. We do not want to see the price of paint go up any further than it has to. Let me show you the fee schedule here. Like I said for a small can, it is a smaller fee. The largest can that we'll accept is a five gallon can, so that has the, the highest fee and you see the range there. Um, in our programs across the country, we do not have the same fee schedule, and that's because the cost of transportation and the, the cost of services is different in every single state. And as I said, we want to keep it as low as possible, so we tailor it to every state. We will send an auditor into every single state to kind of um, do the research and determine what transportation costs are, what collection costs are, what the bins cost everything so that we can develop that fee schedule and tailor it to ev each and every state program. So our legislative efforts. Just want to give you a little bit of a um, couple of points on our legislative effort efforts. Um, for, for new programs, you know, for expanding this program to new states. Um, and I almost don't even feel like Massachusetts is a new state because we've been working here for so long. But um, <laughs> it is kind of the same process. You know, it, it's a question of identifying who are your stakeholders, who are your supporters, who's not going to support you. And, who's, and of those people who are, are groups that are not going to support you, who's going to be the most vocal? Um, and, and are those issues or questions that you can respond to? Um, so it's a huge education process from the stakeholder organizations to the members of the legislature. And, and that's what I spend a lot of my time doing is answering questions and just really trying to make sure that people understand this um, program. Um, Throughout the country, I think it, it's been clear to us who our allies are, who the supporting stakeholders are. Um, it's not always clear who is in opposition. Um, and it's not consistent from state to state. I mean, sometimes a group will show up that has an issue that, believe me, you've just never even thought of before. Um, the retailers have been a challenging group for us to work with, and, and it's, um, it's unfortunate uh, because the retailers in a new state you know, don't have a knowledge base. They don't, they don't have any experience with the program. You know, the, the best thing they could do is to call their peers in other states and try to ask questions. Um, that doesn't happen very often from my experience. <laughs> Um, so it's really, it's a fear of the unknown and, and retailers, um, you have to under, I had, it took me a long time to understand this, that there are retail stores in every single legislator's district. There are not paint manufacturers in every single legislator's district. And there are not paint recyclers in every single district. And, and I'm, Sure, this may not, hopefully, isn't news to you all, but legislators don't always know a lot about waste management industry. So, <laughs> um, so that's always put us in a little bit of a difficult position because the retailers are 
very vocal and they are constantly hit by a long list of issues like you know property taxes and bag bans and all kinds of different issues and then we come in as the paint industry and say hey we've got this great program for you guys and their initial response is oh my gosh that's just more work for us and what kind of floodgates is that going to open so it takes a ton of of education um, to get through to the retail community and even though we're working with 1800 retail locations across the country when you go into a new state that doesn't mean anything to them so that's been our biggest challenge and I, I do want to make one clarification here it's not always the big boxes that are in opposition in fact we work really well with the big boxes we have very good relationships with them and my impression right now is that they're not in opposition uh, to um, to paint stewardship legislation. They're they're kind of agnostic about it. If it happens, they're going to work with us because they all know us. They're working with us in 11 states. Um, they're not actively opposing, but they're not actively supporting either. It's really the rest of the retail community that needs more of the education. Um, so let me see if there's any other points on here I wanted to. Um, for existing programs, we do have legislative issues that come up every once in a while. Um, there are some um, state legislatures and some governors who feel like they can always do better than we can do. So they want to change our program without talking to us. Um, that's why we're continuously working in all of our states, even though they've been operating some of them for 10 years. And, um, you know, our, our goal really is to, to be aggressive and move this program uh, across the country. So um, we're going to keep working in Massachusetts until we get there. And I'm confident that we will. I really hope that it is this year. Um, just give you a couple of statistics here on the program. You see, you've seen our footprint. We're going to add Illinois to it, hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed. Um, in terms of convenience, um, in our program states, 97% uh, of the residents in each of those states has access to a location. I have 15 miles here on my slide, but I think it's actually more like eight miles. You know, within eight miles of every single resident, there's a collection location. We have over 200 manufacturers that are registered in paint care across all of those programs. Like I said, no manufacturer has ever said no to us. Um, and here's our collection statistics. Over 2,400 year-round collection sites. Um, of those 2,400, about 1,800 of them are retail locations. Um, we've had 7,300 HHW or and or paint only collection events, which we do in locations where we are a little bit thin on permanent locations. Um, we have a program called large volume direct pickup. So if you're a paint contractor or you're a hotel or a prison or a school and you have over 100 gallons of paint, we don't want you taking that to a retail location or even to a, a, you know, a transfer station or anything. We'll send a transporter to you to pick it up it's part of our services, no extra charge. You've already paid for it when you've paid your 75 cent fee. Um, and to date, we've collected uh, about 67 million gallons of paint in all of our states. So that number just rises exponentially. Um, this year, we had legislation in four different states. So far, we are hoping to be successful in Illinois and Massachusetts. Um, we lost Maryland on literally the last 30 minutes of the session uh, this year. It was so disappointing, but um, we'll keep working there. And in Missouri, that's kind of a new legislative initiative for us um, in Missouri, but we've had some very good traction. So um, we're just going to keep working. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Very good. Thank you, Heidi. 
So we are running a little short on time. So what we're going to do is uh, take questions from the audience. So what we'll ask you to do is there's a microphone over there. And for our production, that will allow us to hear your questions. So if you don't mind, if you have questions, uh, please do uh, go toward that uh, microphone. Um, and in the meantime, uh, I'll just start with uh, one question uh, that we have, especially because I know we do have a couple of entrepreneurs in the room. Uh, and this one's for uh, Justine. Uh, in Rhode Island and in Connecticut, the percentage of mattress recycling that occurs in each state is about 75%. Do we know how many mattress recycling companies are already in Massachusetts? And do you see Connecticut and Rhode Island in-state recycling trend continuing in Massachusetts? Um, because I think, you know, again, that's something that's uh, interesting to some people who are uh, looking to get in that business who are in this room. But yes, if we, people can line up there at that area to ask questions as well. So uh, Justine. Yeah. Oh. Oh, there you go. Sorry. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so my understanding is that there are, I think, four uh, mattress recyclers in Massachusetts right now. Um, actually, one of them is taking the majority of our mattresses from the state of Rhode Island. Um, so we, they ship them up there to, um, to Massachusetts. So we are using one of those recyclers. Um, in Connecticut, 100% of our, our mattresses are um, recycled in the state. Um, and if we, as long as there's infrastructure in the state for recycling, we'll work with those in-state recyclers. What happened in Rhode Island was we went out, we put out an RFP, and we didn't get anybody in Rhode Island that responded to it. It's a small state. Yeah. Some say it's a county of Massachusetts. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, you know, so we're working, uh, some of it's going to Connecticut, and um, the majority of it's going up to Massachusetts. We do have a, um, one of the recyclers does have a, um, a facility that's drop-off only just to provide convenience for um, small commercial haulers and direct drop-off um, so they don't have to drive up to Fitchburg but um, but yeah if we if we're in Massachusetts I you know because of the waistband that infrastructure is really strong right now so um, we would definitely be it we would definitely have mattress recyclers to work within the state yeah, thank you. And we have a gentleman who has a question. And, and, please, and, and if others have questions, feel free to just uh, filter right behind uh, as well and, and line up. Um, and that would make things so we, we know who has questions. So, uh, uh, sir. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, I have a mattress question, a paint question, and a plastic question, if I might. Uh, on mattresses, okay. I had to take my father-in-law's twin mattress and twin box spring to the town of Dalton's transfer station. They charged me $64 each for that down why <laughs> is it so high it's 10 times what california and other states are doing and, and it would seem to me like a box spring should be less than a mattress because it's less complicated and it would seem to me like it should be based on size do you, do you have any idea why it's so expensive and it's no wonder if mattresses end up in the woods yeah um so th that's a really good point um the Generally, um, in terms of with our fees, we uh, with the visible fees that we have at the point of sale, <coughs> we have the same fee for mattresses and box springs. It's just because it's just a lot easier to track. It's a lot easier for us to audit to make sure that the uh, the retailers um, correctly assessing that fee. Um, but in terms of Massachusetts, the reason why it's so expensive is because of the ban. Um, so <coughs> if if we were to come in under the EPR legislation, we, uh, you would pay at the point of sale for your mattress uh, recycling. It would be a no cost when you went to the Dalton transfer station, but you would have paid a small fee at the point of sale when you purchased your mattress. And then you, know, you don't have to, it's not that mattress you're paying for, so if you have a mattress you're getting rid of in your house, you can take that mattress um, and, and recycle that and use your, you know, use your new mattress until you can't use it anymore and then you can recycle that as well. Um, so the fee would be, you know, it, it's hard to say what the fee would end up being in, in, any, um, in any state before we, um, we start a program um, just because we don't know the transportation costs and what the recyclers are going to charge, um, you know, but it could be anywhere from 15 to maybe $18 per unit as opposed to the 64 that you're paying. Uh, it's a tenth of what I'm paying now, and I don't understand why it's so much. Uh, on paint recycling, um, are there 
toxic emissions or waste production from the paint recycle plants themselves that we should be aware of? And if I have old paint now before the law goes into effect, God willing, uh, what do I do with that? Could I take it to a recycle center or a store and pay a small fee and get it recycled? So for your question about the paint recycling uh, process, paint recyclers are manufacturers as well. So they are subject to all of the environmental laws that every manufacturing facility is subject to. So all of the safeguards inherent in those regulations apply um, and, and should not, you know, it's, it's, it's no more at risk than typical manufacturing. Um, the waste stream of paint typically is 80% water-based product, 20% solvent-based, and that volume of solvent-based actually is decreasing over time um, because air quality regulations basically have forced manufacturers for consumer paints to water-based technologies. So um, we're just not seeing, you know, we're seeing that volume decrease over time as it is. Um, on your question about what do you do with paint that you have right now, so the minute that we pass this law and our, pr our business plan is approved by um, the environmental agency, you can, and we have a collection network set up, you can bring all of that paint. Um, you know, the, the program will handle what we call legacy paint, the paint that's currently in your basements, garages, wherever. Um, even though you didn't pay a fee, you know, that 75 cent or 99 cent fee, even though you did not pay that fee, all of that paint comes into the program and we'll take it right away. Um, nice. So I, if I didn't say it um, during my presentation, you know, one of the ways that we make this program so much more convenient for folks is, you know, similar to the mattress program. You pay <coughs> the fee when you buy the product, but when you turn it in, there's no fee whatsoever. So you can walk into one of our collection locations with four, five, six cans of paint and say, you know, here's my architectural paint that I'm not using right now. Thank you very much, and you're done. And, and finally, I have a plastic question. I, I think there are like six or seven types of plastics. Is anything being done to try to make manufacturers only use two or three types of plastics? And many are not even recyclable in my community. Uh, like, I don't know, they won't take seven and six and that sort of thing. They want one, two, and three, something like that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say that there are several initiatives underway. Um, I believe there's the U.S. Plastics Pact, which is engaging conversations with both recyclers, uh, collectors, and the actual manufacturers of plastic products. They're focusing on um, materials first that are causing the most harm. So uh, single-use plastics, I know, is a big focus. Um, and this has been successfully done in the European Union. They've, uh, I believe, passed a ban on like a plastic fork. It has to be either compostable, um, I think it has to be compostable or recyclable um, in order to be sold. So there's efforts underway. I would um, predict that they'll move slowly, but those conversations are starting to happen. Um, and I definitely think that it's um, being motivated by pressure from consumers because we all know that plastics are causing a lot of problems, a lot of externalities that we all end up paying for in, in one way or another. Um, so I do think it's being addressed. It's just, it's going to feel slow for a while. And before we get to our next question, I just want to acknowledge uh, someone who most of the people here may know and who has put all the work into this and made this happen, Dr. Tom Irwin. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> he has he certainly made my job very easy up here uh, today, and, and uh, so it's been amazing. And also, he gave chocolate springs to everybody. So all the panelists will definitely be back to the Berkshires at least uh, for that. <laughs> for the uh, chocolate. For sure. So, <laughs> uh, so for the next question, um, yeah, uh, sir, go ahead. Hello, so um, as an outsider of Massachusetts, I'm here for an internship. Um, 
hearing the strategy for payment for these services coming you know, directly to the manufacturer, but really that trickles down to the, the customer, the consumer. Um, how would that payment method be compared to, as mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, you know, maybe charging for the volume of trash or recycling product that an individual household comes out? What would that look like for the consumer in terms of a control over how much they're paying for these services? As in, you know, if there's an incentive to reduce my, my personal load for, you know, how much waste I'm producing, you know, could I be saving myself money over a kind of flat rate that the companies themselves are deciding for the products that they produce? So I'll take a stab at that. Um, I think that this model really shifts the purchasing power onto the consumer more so than our current system does. So no one has to buy paint. Um, you could just have a blank drywall wall. Um, so it's kind of the consumer's choice to have a coating. Um, it's going to have protection. It's going to have decorative purposes. Um, so, it, but it is a choice. It's a purchasing decision. And so there's also, I would say, alternatives to that. So instead of going out and buying a new can of paint, um, so in Newton, I run the recycling center there. We have a paint shed. So it's a paint reuse shed. Um, if you're painting something like a doghouse or just some random project at home and you don't really care about the color, instead of going and purchasing new paint and, and having that fee put on you, you could look for some alternative or maybe post online and say, hey, I'm in search of off-white paint. Does anybody have some left over in their basement? Which I'm sure a lot of people would say, yes, please take my paint. Um, so I think that that's the, the way that it more equitably distributes the cost onto its consumer choice. It's a little bit different for a mattress. At some point in time, we're all going to buy one. Um, but at the same time, you could rent a place that already comes with a mattress. And so it, it turns into different choices that a consumer can make to avoid that fee. Whereas the current model, we are all, as taxpayers, paying for a household hazardous waste um, collection system but it's likely that maybe only 10% of residents are accessing it. So we're all paying the same amount, but not receiving the same service or not taking advantage of the same service. I hope that answers what you were looking for. I think it does. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Hi. Yes. Great forum. <laughs> very nice. Okay. Um, this question is for Heidi. So Heidi, this bill has passed successfully in 10 states, and we are at least in our 10th year, fifth legislative season in Massachusetts. So what is different about Massachusetts, or is this normal? It, it's not abnormal. Um, it took us probably 10 years in Washington state took seven or it could have been eight years in New York. Um, so it, it's not abnormal, and I'm actually not sure what normal is um, for a legislative process, but we've only had one state that passed in the first year, and that was Colorado. Um, the So let me just talk specifically about Massachusetts. We have three bills in Massachusetts. Um, they are all basically the same bill. They have the same requirements. Uh, the bill that was introduced by um, Patrick O'Connor might have some um, older language in it because I think he grabbed a bill from maybe a, a session or two ago. And every year I do try to make improvements based upon how the program is operating, if there's something that needs to be clarified. But they are basically all the same bill. Um, we typically, and just some more history, we have passed this bill through the Senate Environment Committee before. Um, actually, Feel like we may have passed it through the Senate, but Correct. I think that was before my time. It passed in the Senate in Massachusetts in 2015. Right. Okay. So that was the first year I started. Um, um, so, you know, what what 
what has occurred almost every year since 2015 is we get held up. We, we typically can pass it through the Environment Committee committees, but we get held up in ways and means. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, Ways and Means has just so many much bigger issues. They pass the budget for the state. You know, they pass the, you know, the budget for each and every one of your agencies. Um, so we're just such a low priority in that particular committee. Um, I've always been told by our, a couple of things by our lobbyists that if we could get through House Ways and Means, it's, it's um, you're going to be successful. That's the sort of gatekeeper for bills is House Ways and Means. I've also been told that, you know, it's not the number of supporters that you have, it's the number of uh, opposition and the character of the opposition that tends to hold more weight than who's supporting your bill. Um, and, you know, and as I've already said before, there's a retailer in every single legislator's district. So their voice is a little bit louder than ours. Um, you know, we're really trying to leverage the momentum that Tom has created with these types of forums. And, you know, we've seen the op-ed pieces in the, um, you know, the local papers around the state. We're doing our best to push them out and push them forward. Our lobbyist is using them. Um, you know, we are really trying to get past that hurdle of the Ways and Means Committee. Um, sometimes we're just a victim of the legislative schedule. You know, they kind of run out of time before they get to us. I've never had a legislator tell me in Massachusetts that we're not going to do this. Every single legislator I've ever talked to has said, oh, this is a great idea. We've talked to the agency. They're completely on board. So sometimes it's like we're fighting an invisible enemy <laughs> or an invisible barrier somehow so i'm, I'm not sure what the exact answer okay. to your question well, let's is let's hope it's soon some of us are not getting younger yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm with you there sharon <laughs> very nice very nice Hi, um, my name is Juliette Haas. I'm with the town of Egremont. I'm the sustainability coordinator. Egremont is very unusual in that a town our size has a sustainability coordinator position. Um, I'm truly grateful for that. And I want to thank Heidi and Justine for your excellent presentations and really explaining how your industry works on this issue. Um, just to follow up on the first question about um, mattresses because of the waistband, um, $65 a mattress is a high price, and the waistband, mattress waistband, forced our community, when I say forced, I mean, of course, recycling mattresses is a good thing, um, but it forced us to really work with a collector, and we have a very good deal. We pay 35 hmm. so talk to your hauler um, <laughs> yeah. and get a, get, really. a, get a better price. Um, so um, thank you again for your presentation and explaining how your industries are handling um, this issue. Um, good luck with the legislative process. Um, it was shocking to see in the map that Massachusetts and New Hampshire seem to have a problem with passing the legislation. Come on, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. um, and um, fingers crossed. Could you give us an idea of other industries, of other products that maybe can follow? It's obviously very difficult to get this kind of legislation passed, that this is 10 plus years. But what type of other industries could certainly have programs like these, take back programs at the retail level um, to reduce our solid waste? You want to take that? I mean, you sure. Yeah. You have the list up there. Yeah. Um, so some of the other material types um, or product categories would be electronics. Um, there's 24 states right now in the country that have some sort of electronics EPR law. Um, there's also things like um, light bulbs, batteries. Um, I would think of things that we would classify as hard to manage or difficult to get rid of. Um, Pharmaceuticals. Oh yeah, pharmaceuticals is a good one. Tires. Tires um, 
Recently, there was um, a law passed in Connecticut for propane tanks, um, things that are looked at as harmful in the waste stream. So when somebody throws a propane tank into their trash and, you know, the trash driver doesn't see it, it ends up at the facility, it can cause a small explosion. Like there's videos of that. Um, And batteries are increasing in attention because they're causing fires. The lithium ion batteries are causing fires. Um, so those are, are materials that may be able to garner um, more attention, but it's kind of always a, a tough sell. Um, Vermont also just passed a bill, for the first one in the country, for household hazardous waste, which is a category that includes things like pesticides and um, all sorts of different cleaning products and uh, just a very wide array of things. So that's also, that kind of falls more like electronics where there's like, you have to define the scope of what's included and what's excluded. And then you end up with a really high number of producers in that in that system. Same thing for packaging. Um, you end up with a lot of different manufacturers to kind of manage and bring into the program and get them on board. Um, I hope that helps. There's there's definitely a number of um, products that this would be applicable for, and there's examples of kind of elsewhere in the world. Yeah, and I would also recommend looking at the Product Stewardship Institute website. They have a really good explanation about all the different types of products that that are possible. Okay, we're going to leave uh, the questions there, uh, and, and the panelists I know will be here to have conversations afterward, but um, you know, this is here to, to create advocacy for these, so I'd like to throw that out to the panelists uh, to indicate to everyone here and for the audience you know, what are things that they can do uh, to advocate for uh, these programs and create more sustainability and environmental friendliness. So if, if you each want to just take a, a minute or so to say what can we all do uh, to support these programs, maybe Juanita, you can start. Sure. I'll say if you can do one thing, it's contact your state legislator and ensure that they are supporting uh, these bills and ask them to be a co-signer because the number of co-signers gets attention from the leadership within the legislature. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, the only other thing I would add is if there's a way to quantify how much your county or municipality is spending on paint as a waste stream, and you may already have that information, but that is helpful for, for me to make the business case. You know, you need to do this for the state of Massachusetts because, you know, Dorchester County is going to save this much and, you know, every county is going to save this much by, uh, by passing this law. That is helpful. Yeah, and I would just echo, you know, what, what both Heidi and Juanita said. Um, and I think, you know, really working with your legislator um, to let them know that this is something that you want. Um, hopefully, you would um, promote um, H881. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, I think, and, and, and I know that uh, Mass Recycle does a really good job of also working with, within municipalities um, and advocacy groups so that, um, that they can you know, provide support, they provide letters um, that you can use um, to contact your legislator. So, um, just using, I mean, there, there is, there, there are things that are available to help you do it and, and make it easy. What is the number for the paint bill? And, and just uh, real oh. quickly, also, uh, just so for these bills, our state legislators are actually co-sponsors for each of these. So our legislators are in support of these bills, uh, but if you can get, yeah, the number, if you have that, do we have that number? Yeah, for paint, the bill numbers are H823, S551, and S542. Thank you. I have too many bills in my head. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. S551. Oh, sorry. The last one was S542. Very good. So, and they're all good, even though they're three different bills. They're, so they're substantially the same. They're, okay. Yeah. They're basically the same. 
So I want to thank once again our panelists, and of course we'll be here for conversation afterward as well for everyone here, uh, Juanita Traybird, uh, Heidi McAuliffe, and Justine Fallon. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful, wonderful night, everyone.